broadcast of this program is made possible in part by the South Carolina Farm Bureau, online at scfb.org, and by Time Warner Cable, online at timewarnercable.com. Broadcast of this program is made possible in part by the South Carolina Farm Bureau, online at scfb.org, and by Time Warner Cable, online at timewarnercable.com. And welcome back to this week in the State House as this session of the General Assembly continues to go forward. Over in the Senate, they continue to be dealing with the ethics bill. Other issues are popping up. Uh, they're still involved in committees. And we're going to talk today about the road system again. What's going on? Should the Ravenel Bridge have a, some sort of de-icing system? What's going on out in the interstate with the paving of roads? What's the issue here about transportation in South Carolina? And is it an issue to you and to the members of the General Assembly? Before I introduce our guest today, of course, got to take care of a few housekeeping um, chores. And they're really a pleasure to do it because we want to thank Time Warner Cable and the South Carolina Farm Bureau for making this broadcast possible. And of course, to our friends in 518 of the Block Building who all tuned in, I hope you find this program extremely illuminating to you on the question of the road system. I also want to thank South Carolina Educational Television for the producing of this broadcast and the South Carolina Press Association for their assistance. Now down to what we're going to be talking about roads and I'm going to turn to two guests who've been with us before but are very knowledgeable in this particular area. Senator John Scott comes to us, Richland County. I think right. your district's all in Richland, isn't it? All of it is in Richland, correct. He's a Democrat serving in the South Carolina Senate, very knowledgeable in the area of transportation and roads. Right next to him from Berkeley County, Senator Larry Grooms, you're chairman of the Senate Transportation Committee. He's a Republican from Charleston. So, ladies and gentlemen, we have both a Democrat and Republican here, and I'm going to jump right into it to both of you. I want to thank you all for agreeing to be on the show. We are told that South Carolina has $48.3 billion of road needs, that we only have about $19.3 billion to cover it, which means that we are leaving $29 billion right now uncovered. The highways out there, I-20's got ruts in it, Interstate 26. This state is gliding to gridlock on the roads. We're not building new lanes. We're not maintaining what we got. To both of you, what, what's the challenge here? What's the problem? I think you have to, uh, we listened to uh, the state of the state um, the earlier part of the year um, and were told that any spending bill that would be coming to the governor's desk would be vetoed. Um, I can't thought of how to put the Senate and the legislature in a non-planning position. I don't know how you not plan for a $29 billion uh, commitment you need to make to the citizens of South Carolina. Uh, last year, I think we created about a billion dollars that will do very little. As we look across the, the country, the feds aren't giving us a lot more money. They're cutting money. So that responsibility is going to fall on the state. If we don't begin to do some real serious long-term planning, begin to talk about um, some bonding so that we can get some of this work done. And above all, the work be done by South Carolina contractors. A lot of this work is being done by out-of-state companies. They make their, they feed, they go away, and we're left with the mess that they've created here in South Carolina. Senator Grooms. We've got needs in South Carolina, absolutely. 
Um, the Department of Transportation does not have the resources that it needs to maintain our highway network, b bottom line, much less the dollars that it's going to take to expand our highway network to take care of an ever-growing South Carolina. Um, I've put forward plans um, going back seven years ago to take a portion of the growth in new revenues and dedicate those for highways, for maintenance uh, and, new, um, and new roads. Uh, but there's um, a, a growing debate within the General Assembly, it's been simmering for some time, that the only way to provide additional revenue to the DOT would be through increased gasoline tax or increased taxes um, on, on other items. Um, when you look at the um, uh, general fund balance, uh, in the last two years, we're really last three years now, we just had a um, finance committee meeting on, on Tuesday uh, where the uh, state budget office gave us some numbers to show that we had $600 million in new monies this year. And under a plan that I put forward, we would take 20% of the new money uh, and dedicate that for highways. And there's, there's a difference between, I think, what the governor was proposing in her State of the State address when she said that at the end of the year, if there's any monies left over, then we'll put those to roads. Uh, we, we know what the new monies are this year. If we dedicate those to highways, take a percentage of that, next year take another percentage of that. So it, we, could, we could still use 80% of all the new money for other programs. Uh, we've got great needs in our state. I just want to dedicate 20% of new growth to highways. You know, that would probably work, but the reality is that we are basically a $6.8 billion budget, and in its best year, maybe a $78 billion budget. Last year, we could not even meet all the demands that we had. Our state employees, in fact, did not get any kind of raise. Uh, their insurance went up. Their retirement amount, their contribution to the retirement plan went up. We just can't continue to operate that. We've got to maintain pace with our teachers and making sure that the money um, is going there. What we have been doing to offset, that, offset uh, those years when we didn't have money. We've been laying people off uh, by simply not filling FTEs. Well, at some point, that's not going to work. The inflationary rate is going to catch up with you. You're going to have to make the tough decision. If you're going to build roads, you're going to have to either have a dedicated tax, uh, like, like the senator talked about, or you're going to have to issue some bonds. And inside the general appropriation, make sure we can pay, make the payments. Other than that, uh, hope, hoping that you can do some kind of long-range planning, taking a little piece here and a little piece there. You don't get the, the best bang for your buck when you, when you do it that way. Well, let me ask both of you. First of all, it's my understanding that the General Assembly, and it was signed into law, agreed to borrow $550 million. It was it vetoed or that was that agreed to? To borrow the 550 million. That was agreed to. That's that's last year. That's, that's last, last year. year. Road money. All right. So we've gone now in debt a half a billion dollars on roads. Right. Uh, we got 19.3 billion of unfunded needs yeah. right now on the roads, as I understand it, to make repairs. That's what I understand that money's for. That's not new construction. That's not three lanes up the interstate and everything. Now. I'm also told that y'all transferred the car sales tax to the tune of about $80 million a year over to the roads. Is that correct? $50 million. Um, was it $50 million? Yeah. The, the Senate, the, I think the Senate version was um, more than that, uh, and the House limited it to $50 million last year. Yeah. All right. So that was money that used to be in the general fund that's now going to pay for roads, right. the car sales tax. I just want to make sure so that our... our, our viewing audience can understand this. And the 550 million that was borrowed, where's that go, what, what income stream is servicing that? Do you, do you all recall? But part, what, go ahead. Uh, part of it would be the sales tax on automobiles. So of, the, of this 80 million, part of it is going to be used to service that half a billion dollar right. uh, debt. debt service so in, la in last year's budget, there was a dedicated revenue stream of 50 million dollars. Um, uh, for road construction. Uh, there were other well, one-time monies uh, of another 50 million. Um, and then there was some, um, at the end of the year, uh, there was a, uh, some, some monies unobligated that also went for road construction. So all in all, about $140 million last year went to the Department of Transportation. So my, my question, y'all, is if we, if we got $29 billion of needs, 
without the new construction, this is like a raindrop in a reservoir. Correct. And I mean, in terms of what it's going to do. Yes. And, and, and the way we, we, we structure it, um, uh, the, um, uh, the infrastructure bank makes that decision where this money is going to go. And those uh, units of government get the opportunity also to be it toward their projects they have back home in the, on their home counties. So we're really not fixing the, the kind of issues you're talking about with I-20, 26, 277, those issues. And that money really won't even do very much of anything to fix those concerns. Um, there's still an issue out there in the rural areas with these dirt roads and what we're going to do with them, especially those roads that are, uh, that are traveled heavily by school buses and, and also by the mail, the mail carrier and others. The um, reality is that we've got to get serious about fixing roads in South Carolina. We have, we're, not, if we're not going to do a dedicated tax. We've got to make, make sure that we make a decision that we're going to borrow some money and make our payments on the bond so we can get something done and do some but real But doesn't borrowing mean that it could mm -hmm. cost more for it, what we're getting? Well, not, nece not, necessarily. not necessarily. Not necessarily. How about explain that to them so that they not, would understand? Not necessarily. If you look at where the, where the bond market is right now, it's probably the lowest it's ever been in a long, long period of time. You're going to play, pay some surplus on it, but having already done the long-range plan puts you in a position to negotiate a better deal in getting your roads done because you're bidding in large, in large bulk versus the way we normally do, just small independent, independent roads. So you're locked in uh, yet to what you call a, a good price, but may not necessarily be the best price. Also, as the money set there to offset the interest rate, you're still making money off the money, especially if you've already gotten the bond money set on a trust account. The other part is in looking at what um, those local units of government have done who, in fact, have, well, have set aside an extra penny. And, and also creating some relationships with them to fix some of their concerns that where the local roads and state roads run together. So you, you put yourself in a, in a better position to negotiate with local government, also these contractors who, who can do some work. In Richland County, I, I, I did a complete road uh, analysis of all the roads needed to be done. I had given it to the uh, DOT person, so they knew all these roads both in the city and the county. As you go through that list, you can prioritize what you can get done and what you cannot get done. And in working with those units of government, they also help you pay, pay that bill, especially if they've already um, did the penny. Sandy, do you have anything you want to add in this? Uh, the trick, even with borrowing, is there has to be a dedicated revenue stream. You, you can't just borrow money without a, a means to pay back the debt. Right. Uh, and, and so it goes into having a dedicated revenue stream. Last year in the budget, $50 million was set aside in recurring money for a revenue stream to the DOT. Uh, under plans that I put forward, that number would grow until we reach a point of 5% of the general fund revenue that would be dedicated, a dedicated revenue stream. And in this year's budget, if, if we had started uh, several years ago, that number this year, instead of being 50 million, would be 350 million. And that would continue to grow. Uh, and in a course of about seven years, that amount would exceed what we currently give to the DOT or provide to the DOT in the form of a gasoline tax. So in essence, the, the amount of state dollars would double to the DOT in about a seven or eight year period, but, based, based, on, based on growth. But, but at the same token, you're paying seven year old costs to do 2014 year old work. So you still, didn't, you still didn't gain anything doing that. You still lost, you paid more waiting on hoping that revenue come in. Now if you look at um, um, how budget has been uh, and, and waiting on the growth, one year it might be six billion, another year it might be six two, six five. You don't ever really know what's gonna come in. The other part is we still have to deal with inflationary rate uh, as it relates to making sure our teachers are paid by the national average, being able to take care of our state employees. So that's still not the best way to do it. We're either going to make a decision to raise gasoline tax, raise some kind of dedicated tax, a bond, and you then have the opportunity to deal with prices right now. They're not going to go down. They're going to continue to go up. But, but what I'm hearing, and, and, and with the money that, that would come in, for instance, Senator, if your plan goes through, mm -hmm these bonds and everything, when I look at these statistics, to those viewers out there, their roads are not going to get fixed. This is not enough. We're too far behind. We'll fix it in seven years, because the money will come in in seven years. They want them fixed now. 
They want to fix now. So we'll bid them seven years for now and probably be twice time. It costs us twice as much to do it. But if you've got 19.3 billion of repairs. 19.3 .3 billion over an extended period of time. Uh, right now the DOT receives about $600 million in gasoline taxes that is generated in South Carolina, South Carolina gas tax. Uh, and uh, also when you buy gasoline, a portion of that goes to the federal government, federal gas tax. And uh, federally, there, there, are federally um, uh, there are federal highways uh, and we can draw down federal monies. So the DOT budget is a little more than $1.2 billion. So it's a mixture of federal and state, but we need additional state dollars to draw down more federal dollars. So the, an increase of $600 million in state money to $1.2 billion in state money would draw down more federal monies and help close the gap. So they, there, there is a multiplier effect with the right. amount of money, of state, money. Of state money. But, but, but at the same token, look at I-95. Once I leave Savannah, Georgia, coming to South Carolina, it bottlenecks. We've been talking about for a long time, for a long time, how are we going to make that a six-lane highway? Willow, uh, all the way from Savannah, Georgia, to Miami, Florida. That was going to be my next question, well, no question. to y'all. I mean, Besides these repairs, how is the public going to get the additional lanes on the interstates, the overpasses it absolutely. needs, the things, I mean, and the traffic is backing up, the roads are getting worse. I-20, I'm telling you, it's two inches and three inches deep ruts and flaked off pavement and everything. $600 million a year in state money to the Department of Transportation is not working. It, they have to have more money to be able to maintain our existing network uh, and be able to expand to meet our needs. That, that's no question. I don't think there's a legislator that wouldn't agree to that. The, the, the question is, how do, we, how do we adequately fund the Department of Transportation? Are we going to increase taxes or are we going to shift a portion of new revenue to the DOT? That, that's, that's the big debate and I believe that debate will occur this year on the Senate floor. Well, let, let me ask both of you, had, hadn't the governor pretty much taken the position that if the Senate decided to pass a gas tax, she would veto it? veto it. So, and, 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 and to look at trying to put it, uh, give additional revenue from the General Assembly when we're not already meeting all the needs that we have, really doesn't make a whole lot of sense. The real reality uh, that most folk don't want to deal with who's conservative is raising taxes to pay the bills. I think people would rather be safe and know that their children are traveling up and down these highways and pay a little bit more to make that happen. All right, let me ask you all on two other subjects because we've only got 10 minutes left. Time really passes in these broadcasts real quick. Um, there was an article in the Post and Courier that the uh, Council of Governments had voted to cut some, allow tree cutting on the interstate. What's the issue down there about that tree cutting, Senator? Uh, if, if you travel uh, between Charleston uh, and Columbia, uh, between I-95 and Charleston, you, you've got our, our, the median, uh, and it is a tree-line median. Uh, it's, 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 it's a beautiful stretch of trees. The, I, I enjoy seeing the trees. The trees um, deflect some of the sun when it's hitting you in the eyes, it's, it, and, and it looks good. It, it really does. It doesn't look like um, most interstate highways across the, the nation. Uh, Charleston's my home. It, it's a very special place. Uh, we, we often beautify our highways by planting trees. I like to see the pine trees, but it's, but it's also over the years, um, and the Post and Courier did um, a story a number of years ago about the number of fatalities. There's some spots uh, where some folks have lost their lives and it's been a number of serious accidents. Uh, the Department of Transportation took a look uh, at the statistics and uh, worked with the Federal Highway Administration, came up with a proposal to clear cut 27 miles of the trees in the median and put a cable barrier. Uh, I, I wasn't um, too pleased with the solution just to clear cut all the trees. It seemed to be an easy solution, but the best solutions aren't necessarily the most easy solutions. Um, I, I, um, I brought it to the attention of the Senate. Uh, we were able to put a proviso in the budget that required the DOT to gain um, a approval of the Low Country Council of Governments, the representatives from Berkeley, Charleston, Dorchester counties, Indian municipalities. Uh, there was a public hearing held, and the, the vast majority of the residents of Low Country don't want the trees cut, but we also understand we deserve safety. We deserve to have safe highways. And the choice that the DOT was offering initially was you can have beauty or safety, but you can't have both. And I rejected that. 
And so after, um, after numerous hearings, uh, meetings with uh, DOT engineers and others, we came up with a plan where 17 miles of trees would still remain, uh, about four miles, four or five miles of trees would be cut, and both, uh, the, and, and cable barriers would be placed in the median. Um, either in the center where the trees would be cut or on both sides where the trees would remain. So we are going to now have safety and beauty that the trees provide. Both things. You well, want to add anything well, on that? I, I, I won't get into the, the Charleston discussion of what, what's going on with these trees. <laughs> I can simply say, um, having traveled down um, 321, halfway 321, some of the back roads coming off 95, coming back into Columbia, uh, it is important that the DOT uh, be able to trim those trees because we got a mess and I don't know how much that mess is going to cost us to get cleaned up and it's dangerous traveling on those little two-lane highways with a, either a tree limb hanging over a tree in, in the road and so as Charleston deal with beauty versus safety um, for those who are in those rural communities on small roads I want to cut trees cut them, make sure we got enough clearance back from it. These pine trees, when the ice hit it, they pop and they snap and they're right in the middle of the road. And someone who's, who's going home in the dark um, could easily get killed running over, over those pine trees. The, the true cost is how much uh, this clearance gonna cost us and can we plan long range to make sure that uh, we've got enough stuff cleared back in case we get another ice storm. For the same money we need to be putting on roads and close that discussion about cutting these trees, get them cut, let's move on down the road and, and stop paving some of these roads out there. Well, let me ask you another question has come up. The Ravenel Bridge, icing of the Ravenel Bridge, is that, a, is that a recurring problem or is it once in a decade? And what's this talk about the warranty and de-icing? Can, can either of you help our viewers understand what that big issue is? Well, with the last two ice storms, um, w we discovered some things about the Ravenel Bridge. The Ravenel Bridge is a unique piece of infrastructure. It is the longest cable-stayed bridge in North America, um, it, so it's a little bit unique. Uh, the Ravenel Bridge, um, over the last nine years, we've had, we've had no icing problems with the bridge, but we had a unique weather situation and, and it repeated itself, and the bridge iced over. Um, the Ravenel Bridge, unlike every other bridge in the state, has a self-contained drainage system. Uh, the other bridges across our state, uh, you could put down a brine solution, you could place the um, sand on top of the brine, and, and for the most part, that keeps the bridges from icing. But the Rathnell Bridge, the, uh, a brine solution was placed down and it, and it washed away. The sand wasn't placed on the bridge, which would hold the brine solution in place. And the sand wasn't placed on the bridge because it has a closed drainage system. That is, if the sand had been placed there, the sand would have washed into the drainage system and would have probably clogged it up, which would have then required um, a, a very, very expensive fix. It would have required lanes to be closed while the system was taken apart and, and reassembled. So th th there's reasons why the DOT didn't place sand. Now we're looking back at the bridge, uh, the DOT studying uh, what could be done. The, as as um, the folks in Charleston know, the bridge has four lanes in each direction, an eight-lane bridge. Uh, so the DOT will be looking at some low-cost solutions to ensure it doesn't ice over again. Some people have proposed some very expensive solutions, but for once in a decade problem, uh, we don't need an expensive solution. Let's take, it, let's take a look at what could occur low-cost. Perhaps just closing two of the lanes, placing sand over the salt, in such a way that the sand would not wash into the closed drain system. That could occur. Some, some large icicles fell from the structure. Uh, that's another problem. Uh, some folks have proposed solutions such as putting um, uh, 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 electricity to heat the cables. That's a very high cost solution. We don't know whether that would work or not, uh, but we're now discovering that there are some sort of coatings that could probably prevent the ice from um, occurring to start with. So taking a look at what coatings are available, we may be able to have some sort of Teflon um, um, coating placed on it. And that would prevent the ice from uh, sticking to the bridge to start with. I would, I would strongly suggest that there are other places across the country and just right next door um, in, uh, in Savannah, there's a bridge over there to find out what some of these other states are doing before we spend that kind of money. I want to really and truly keep our focus on what our number one problems are, and that's to fix what we already have as we continue to have these ice storms. It's going to continue to tear these roads up, 
and very expensive solutions to trying to fix some of these problems. We just can't afford that right now. We got less than three minutes in the broadcast, and I uh, very quickly want to take you out here to I-26. People are looking at that resurfacing job out there. Does the have either of you had a chance to look at that particular look at thing? It. I rode I-26 from exit 123 back to Columbia, from Columbia down to I-23 to Orangeburg on, on Sunday. It's a mess. Um, I really had to pay close attention, and I hit my little smaller car because the lane kind of moved itself over to the other lane. As they extended the outer edge of the road, um, they did not come back and put any real top surface on, on that road to make sure it's safe. It's a mess. I don't know who's done that work, um, but I do know it needs to be revisited. Also, I do know that in the future, we need to look at using some of these South Carolina companies. These folk that get repeated business, especially minority companies, DOT does about 2% in the black community uh, with all the funds that we, we give them. That's probably one reason why there's no real excitement as it comes when it comes down to certain legislators and trying to help provide additional funding. Senator, would you like to comment on it? The, the DOT has a need for more money to do more things, but the DOT has to also be good stewards with the monies they currently receive. Uh, each, the, the state of South Carolina is broken into seven maintenance districts, and the resident maintenance um, engineer for a district has a great deal of autonomy uh, and pretty much controls their district. There's a lot of centralized functions here in Columbia, but the maintenance districts are, are given great latitude in the way they um, uh, issue contracts, in the way they follow up and ensure that the taxpayer dollars are being protected when work is done. Um, some districts do a little bit better job than another. I believe that the uh, maintenance engineer uh, over, over that particular area of I-26 is going to have to answer some hard questions over the inspections on I-26. Do they inspect while they're resurfacing? DOT inspectors are there to inspect to ensure that the taxpayer is getting what they're paying for. Um, uh, the asphalt, the, the, the oxygen content, the bubbles, how, uh, how strong the asphalt will be, all that goes into so the there mix. Are variables on how this asphalt goes down it's, and everything. Th there's there's a lot of variables. There's a lot of variables, and we have inspectors to ensure that when a contractor is performing their work, they're not using uh, an inferior product. W if we're if we're paying for um, grade A asphalt, we need grade A asphalt. We don't need uh, a, a much lower level. And it, and if mistakes are made with a contractor, that's why monies are held back. Uh, How you, much you should don't, they you normally don't, hold back? You, you don't pay the entire contract and then I say you five percent. Well, I'm made looking a at one here where they paid 97 percent and say in the letter that there needs to be some corrective work. But unfortunately for us, we got to correct things because we're out of time. So we'll be back next week with more issues here in the State House. Thank you. Broadcast of this program is made possible in part by Time Warner Cable online at timewarnercable.com and by the South Carolina Farm Bureau online at scfb.org.